I don't care what anybody says. You're never going to stop learning. So any of these guys that pat themselves on the back, that know everything, they're just foolish. But it's always changing. You want to feel the difference. And when that rod tip is too stiff, that very subtle, different pull is indiscernible from those little taps. People will go up. They don't see bass popping. They make a couple casts. They leave. But they don't take the time to try and figure out what's going on under the surface. You know, we'll sit there, do five of those drifts, and not catch one fish, and just go. They'll just keep going to the next spot, next spot. Right. Not me, I'm staying there. You know, you have that moment with all sorts of species of fish where you realize you are not the one that's got the upper hand in the fight, and I realized that very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that fish, it, it took off, it dug my rod tip right into the water. Hello and welcome to the Salt Strong podcast and live stream. My name is Rich Natoli, your regular host of the show, and I'm joined once again by the lovely and talented Ed Gobo. Ed, how you doing, man? I'm good, man. Made it back from Florida in one piece, so we're 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 doing well here. I was surprised you made it back at all, if I'm being honest. It I was so people couldn't see these obviously, but Ed was texting me and I yeah. thought that there was a chance that he would be putting an offer in on a house down there in Tampa <laughs> and staying. And well, not Tampa. Tampa is a whole like crazy place. We were a little bit north of Tampa, uh, just a little south of Home Assassin. It was absolutely the most beautiful place I've ever been. Like, I've never been to any like crazy uh, Caribbean tropical areas, but this this place in Florida, man, is a fisherman's heaven. It's it's amazing. Yeah. And how did you do? How did the whole family um, do? The family kicked my butt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, we ended up going on a so we we went on a charter uh, with a private captain. Uh, the wife caught a red, a decent red. Um, my youngest son caught a speckled trout and a red, um, and then my oldest son caught a decent sized snook, and I ended up with a speckled trout. And the weather wasn't great; like it was super windy and. Probably shouldn't have been out, but we did it anyway. So it was cool. It was a good experience. And then tons of like pier fishing. There's there was two or three parks and piers that we fished in. Um, caught mangrove snappers, spade fish. Um, saw a ton of manatees. Like it's just just beautiful. Yeah. Well, I didn't see any of that up here. <laughs> I was no. going to try to make you jealous with all of my catches, and it, it just didn't work out the way that I wanted to. Uh, got on some fish. I did. I. Do have to say, I don't know if you saw this or not. I think you did, but got the first summer flounder of the year during some pre-fishing that I did over the weekend. I, I did, did see that. Out. I did yeah. see that. It's, uh, you know, part of my job is to know what the trends are. And when the season isn't open, but you're allowed to target the fish, you better get ahead of it, you know, get ahead of the season opener and do some fishing yourself. So that's yeah. what I did. I spent about, I spent an hour on the water. Um, meaning from when I parked the truck on the, the little beach and when I packed it back up. So maybe it's about a half an hour actually fishing and, uh, second drop really nice summer flounder. So it was right exactly where I thought it would be. And, uh, it's just kind of validated it. <laughs> Can't beat that. Actually that, that just tickled the brain. Uh, my youngest son did catch a flounder down there too, that we did keep. Beautiful. Oh yeah. That was cool. Beautiful. Now, did he use one of your bucktails or did you buy something down there um what was he using uh they were we the kids were using live bait little uh they look like shiner they like, actually look like peanut bunker i don't know what they were called gotcha. um they look like peanut bunker without the spot so everyone's gonna make fun of you for not knowing what it is now pilchards i think they call them uh it's all good all right so we're gonna roll fairly quickly into this. I want to just say hello to the people in the chat that have chatted so far so I can see you. So James Flynn, Larry Matzinger, Rob Widmeyer. Uh, we got Mike, Travis, John, MR Johnson, Bill Decals, Peter, Antonio, David, Crabbin and Fishing. So Ben, good to see you in there as well. Um, there's a lot more people watching, but they haven't chatted. So I don't know who it is and, uh, and everything. So that's the only reason I haven't mentioned anyone else. But Ed, you said you were going to be on last week and you weren't. And we had Bayside Dave come on. And I thought it was funny because tonight we have another interesting name coming on. We have Waiter Dave coming on. 
Invasion and of the Daves. Invasion of the Daves with really cool uh, prefixes to their names. So Bayside Dave and now Waiter Dave. And I think this one's awesome. And this is one where Ed and I were talking last week through text. And I said, you know, you should really check out. Uh, now, Ed's also a Salt Strong Insider member. So we're, we're all in there. And I said, you know, you really should make sure you check out the Wade Fishing Mastery course that Waiter Dave put together. And then, and he said, yes, absolutely. And then I said, by the way, he's coming on next week. <laughs> so really great time. He said, with that, I'm going to bring on to the stream with us, Waiter Dave. How are you doing, Dave? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Doing well, I'm sir. Doing awesome. Good. I'm Good. really happy to see you. So want to make sure we start off and uh, you know i could do a little bit of an introduction but the real important thing is that, that you give a sense of who you are to everybody and what you do so you are a guide down in florida uh, waitersguide.com is your website and it's all wade fishing which i think is awesome so if you want to just give a little bit of background to everybody that's that's watching or listening on the podcast that would be great sure sure well i've been fishing in the uh, tampa bay area for a little over 40 years now uh, and started out as a wade fisherman because I was a uh, newly graduated uh, college student that had no money, couldn't afford a boat, had just moved down from Michigan uh, and had a box full of uh, freshwater tackle. And so I'm like, okay, I guess I'm going to learn how to wade. But uh, so that was the easiest way for me was just to jump in the water. And I had no idea that there were sharks and that there were <laughs> Uh, you know, a jellyfish and that, you know, all uh, rays, all the other things that we worry about. And I, like, like most people never done it, right? Popped in barefoot and a pair of shorts and just started fishing and, uh, and didn't catch a darn thing. And, uh, and, and that was pretty much the way it was for the first couple of years of fishing down there. Uh, but slowly, slowly but surely, I, you know, I kind of figured it out on my own. That was uh, in the days before we had internet and all the stuff that uh, that you can learn now in a matter of you know a week on salt strong is about the equivalent of, of probably five years uh used to be right and just trying to figure things out the hard way because people didn't share information they were very protective of where to fish what to use it was all secret right mm -hmm. um and so uh so that's kind of how i got into it and uh you know over the years i you know i managed to to, to be able to buy a, you know, a John boat first, and then a, ended up getting a, a boat. And I thought, wow, the whole new world's gonna open up to me. I'm gonna go to all these places that I swore, if I could just get across that channel, I'm gonna do so much better, right? Or if I could go to that island. And, uh, and so I got the boat and started going to those places. And what I realized was that, and I was fishing from the boat. I didn't do nearly as good fishing from the boat as I did when I was wade fishing. Uh, really what I discovered, the only advantage is that I could go to another place pretty quickly if I wasn't catching fish and then go and not catch fish at that place. Um, so, you know, I, it really got me back in the water and, and, and truly, I, as I said, I, I have, you know, I have kayaks, I have paddle boards, I have a boat, uh, and I only use them to get me to places where I can go wade fishing is really the, the end of it. So, um, it's been my passion for, you know, almost 40 years, as I said, uh, there's not there's probably not very many places from Naples to maybe even Cedar Key here on the uh, west coast of Florida that if there's an access to the water and a fishable flat that I haven't been on at some point or other over the last 40 years. Um, so, uh, and again, even before, you know, we had all the uh, uh, Google Earth and all that, you know, you, you had to find those places by exploring. And that was the only way. So I'd hop in the car and I had a wife who liked to fish and who was tolerant. And we would just, that's what we do. We would take these trips and it was all about trying to find spots where we could get in the water and wade fish. But, um, so I, I, you know, I've been doing it for a long, long time. Uh, I've, you know, there, I had a period where I was doing only bait, you know, using live bait and it was cut bait, uh, fly fishing. I mean, anything, anything, everything to do with fishing, I've been involved with and, and, and love it. But, um, but I've, I've kind of evolved into a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm artificial only, uh, I'm, you know, 95% catch and release. I do, uh, I do on occasion like to have a fish fry at the house and we'll keep a, a stringer of, of trout. Usually if I'm going to keep anything, uh, I feel less guilty about keeping them than I might, you know, some reds or snook or whatever it might be, but, uh, but, but almost all, all artificial. 
And uh, as I said, all, all weight fishing, um, the only exception would be I, I'll bring a kayak or a paddleboard. And that's just really becomes home base for me. I'll put, uh, you know, put my, uh, uh, my gear on there and maybe a cooler and just, just trail it behind me. Uh, so I have, you know, some place to sit while I'm eating or, or if I do decide I'm going to keep a few fish, uh, I'll put it in the cooler because you don't want to be carrying a string or a fish typically when you're weight fishing in the waters <laughs> around here. Just, no. just, ge just generally not a good idea. Um, so, so, anyway, you're, so you're taking it. yeah, and I, I started guiding quite honestly, just on a part-time basis back in about, uh, well, I guess it was probably around two, you know, 2000. Um, I had made a series of, uh, satellite, uh, fishing maps that I was selling at local tackle shops. And so I started getting some guys that would call me up and say, Hey, listen, why don't you take me out, right? I'll pay you, you know, if you buy, I'm like, wow, you're going to pay me to go fishing. It doesn't get any better than that. Um, so I started doing that and, uh, and just, I'm like, wow, this is really, really enjoyed it. And I was working a full-time job back then. So it was pretty much weekends. Um, so, you know, typically crowded places and all that. But, uh, so I did that for, you know, it's probably 15, 17 years. Um, I retired uh, from my real job you know, about, uh, it's been about five years ago now, five, six years ago. And I, my wife said, you know, what are you going to do now you're retired? You, you know, you're, you got to do something to stay busy. Or you're going to be back to work again. And so, uh, I said, you know, I'm not sure. And so, uh, she says, you know, you're on that, on your iPad every morning when I come out here at five o'clock in the morning, because we're both early risers and you're on that darn salt strong or whatever it's called website. She says, why don't you go do something with them? And I said, wow, that's actually probably not a bad idea. So uh, so actually that morning, I uh, actually sent an email off to, to Joe Simons. I was an insider, obviously, at that point in time. I think they had about 3,000 insiders at the time. Uh, I said, I love your, obviously, I love the website. I love all the instructional stuff. I said, but you don't have a lot of wade fishing content. And said, you know, I'm, I'm a lifelong wade fisherman. I've written articles for a number of different uh, publications over the years. Um, I said, I'll send you what I've done. I said, but I'd, I'd love to see if there's a way to get involved with Salt Strong. And um, he emailed me back in about an hour. He said, yeah, let's have a call and a conversation. We did that day. Uh, Luke got on the phone and he said, you want to do a podcast tomorrow? And uh, I said, well, I'm not sure. I don't know what a podcast is, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to give it a try. So, so that's how we started. And actually, uh, as he was trying to pronounce my last name, uh, as he was introducing the podcast, he couldn't say it. So he just said, Waiter Dave. So that's how I became Waiter Dave. And oh, that's how it Joe. started. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll get, so I was never Waiter Dave uh, up until uh, my first conversation with Joe Simons, but that's how it started. So, uh, and it's been, uh, it's been stuck with me ever since. So that's why in the, in the, uh, Wade fishing mastery course at the very beginning, he introduces you not by your name, but by Waiter Dave. That's correct. Cause he still I, can't I, say my last name. Yeah. So that, that's much easier. In fact, nobody can say my last name. So it's, it's actually probably much easier that way than anything else. I, I could try. Ready? You can try. Yeah. Open Alp. Yeah, actually that's pretty good. Yeah. You can is the way it's. You can uh, I didn't yeah. know which one to go at the beginning. All right. Well, that's all right. <laughs> pretty, pretty close. But wait, waiter Dave or just Dave is, is perfectly fine. Believe me. I, I love the waiter Dave thing though. I, I, I would give Joe a high five on that one if I were you, because that, what a great brand for you, because it really. Yeah, no, no, I, believe me, I have, I've given him, him given him some high fives uh, for doing that. Yeah. And th this is, you know, it, it's interesting, Dave, because one of the, the biggest, uh, I wouldn't say it's a criticism, but requests that I get is look, you got to do more for us wade fishermen where there's more of us than you think. Um, you know, I love, you know, I get feedback. I really love watching your videos, but I can't reach those spots. And I, I really need a little bit more information about wade fishing. So it's great that you're coming on tonight to talk about that because I know for a fact that we have a lot of, I'm looking at some names in the chat right now. And again, I can't even see everyone that's, that's actually watching, but that are wade fishermen or love wade fishing. And, uh, you know, a couple of them have actually asked for information. So I'm glad you're here. And, and I wonder if we could just dive right in and start talking sure. about some of the most important things that uh, are necessary to be a successful wade fisherman. You know, you have, I think it's funny, you have the kayak. So you have a thousand dollar, two thousand, three thousand dollar platform to sit down and eat, 
eat lunch on, which is luxury <laughs> wade fishing in my, in my opinion. I think that's awesome. I, I think that's great. Um, yeah, well, don't forget the $80,000 boat that I used to get you that I can beach and, <laughs> and, and get out and wade fish. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, let's talk about, let's let's take it from the perspective of somebody that uh, they really want to start wade fishing a little bit more. Now, and wade fishing is a little bit different than shore fishing. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of places in the Northeast, people will say that they're they're fishing from shore and they limit themselves really to marsh banks and bridges and docks and piers. But what you're talking about is really just getting in the water and exploring an expanse of water on your feet, walking straight across the flats, right? That's it. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I, I started, you know, bridges and piers and all those things because they were easy to get to. And uh, you get to see other people, a good way to learn. But uh, I also learned that there's a lot of people around when you're doing those things. So uh, I started, as I said, exploring and getting in the water. But yeah, it, for me, it's all about being in the water. And even the beach, I, I, we, we do a lot of beach fishing here, which surprises people. It's not like you see up in the Northeast where we're, we're having, you know, 10 foot surf casting rods and, you know, 8,000 reels. Uh, I'm, I'm using the same thing when I fish the beach that I do when I'm fishing, fishing the flats. And that's typically, you know, a seven, six uh, medium power, fast action rod, uh, a 3,000, you know, 3,000 size reel surprising a lot of people, eight to 10 pound braid. Um, and what I might upsize on if there's snook out on the beach, which is the primary target in the summer times out here, you know, I'll, I'll throw 30 pound, uh, you know, leader on there. And in fact, typically it's just mono leader. Uh, but, you know, you don't have all the structure to worry about most of the time when we're fishing the beaches here, it's pretty clean. They can run, they're not going to get, uh, you know, get wound up and stuff. So you can fish light. Uh, and still have enough power to land the fish quickly enough that you're not wearing it out in the summertime and it's going to be distressed. But, um, but so, so, you know, the other thing too, is it, it's just, it, it's not, it's not gear intensive. Um, it's really, you know, it's a minimalist approach to fishing. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to catch the minimal amount of fish. I, I think the minimal approach actually, um, gives the opportunity to, to surprise a lot of people, uh, not only a lot of fish, but some really big fish. And uh, especially down here in Florida. I mean, I you know, you catch 40 inch plus snook in two and a half feet of water off the beach or you know, near the inlets here. Um, you know, I have you know, 40 inch redfish on the flats, uh, you know, big, big snook or big, uh, big trout, whatever. I mean, those we catch all those things and I catch all those while I'm weight fishing. And that, I think that may surprise people more than anything. When, I, when they see my pictures, um, with a, a, a you know 40 inch snook and I'm in my waders and, and a, you know put it over there like how you doing that right and right. Uh, and, and I said listen these big fish actually will hang out in some of the shallowest water you've ever seen uh, it, it's crazy and in, and for a long time I didn't I didn't understand it either I always found myself like a lot of people I just go to as deep as I could go without you know is is, is uh, you know with my hands up just so my reel wouldn't get wet well I realized that that in, in what I realized over time was that actually most of the fish were behind me and yeah. between me and the, between me and the shoreline. And so I think that's kind of uh, a big part of the focus. So, so what I tell people, listen, you, you don't need a lot of, a lot of fancy, expensive gear or, or, you know, heavy stuff. Um, and if you're fishing in the summertime here, and even, you know, I fish Cape Cod, uh, mm -hmm. at least two to two weeks to maybe four weeks every summer. And I don't wear waders up there. So all you really need is a, a pair of shorts. I always wear a long sleeve, you know, Columbia style fishing shirt. But uh, a pair, a good pair of booties is absolutely imperative and maybe the most important piece of equipment uh, so that, you know, if you're stepping on rocks or oyster beds or you happen to bump into some of the creatures that are on there, you're, you're not going to, it's not going to be a problem for you, right? Um, but, but that, a, a, a hat and a, a good pair of polarized glasses, that's it. Uh, that's your equipment. So, you know, as I tell people for about 500 bucks, maybe you can buy a rod, a reel, all the clothing you need, the booties and, you know, enough lures to last you a month. Um, and, and not, not be compromising on the quality of the stuff that you're buying. Right. Um, so, you know, as I told people, don't, you don't need to overdo it. And if you're going to get started in it, don't feel like you need to go out and spend a fortune. 
so I mean that that's kind of the, the least that I tell people it's not a it's not a big investment. Keep it simple. Um, and that's to me is one of the one of the beauties of weight fishing. But uh, but probably the, the the you know the question I get most is where do I go? Right? I can figure out the equipment that I need and I know what I can put on, but where do I go? And so you know, as I, I tell people, I said, well, you know what, you've got a you've got a tool these days that is better than anything ever was, right? I mean, and so, you know, we, on Salt Strong, right? We've got, you can go with all the satellite imaging we've got there, right? And and it's taken, you know, so the Salt Strong platform is like Google on steroids with right. everything that it has, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or, or, or uh, uh, you know, it's just, it's it's crazy. Um, and I told you, you've got a, an incredible tool here, but it's all about looking for access points to start with, right? So, you know, I said, listen, go, go on the map, pick a shoreline and start looking for areas that you can access that shoreline, right? And and some of them are easy enough to, causeways are a great place to start. And I always tell people because they're, you can usually, you can park right next to where you're gonna fish. Um, you know, normally there's, uh, you know, most every causeway, at least down here, you've got shallow, shallow uh, area adjacent right to the causeway. You probably got some sort of rubble or other structure that's, that's along there. And then, to, you know, more often than not, there's a bit of a slow drop off. And then almost always, at least on one side of the causeway, there's a deep channel. And that, it's, that's where they dug to, to get the fill to create the, uh, the causeway, right? So, so all of a sudden, you've kind of got this built-in structure uh, within, you know, certainly within casting distance of the shoreline. And very often, you don't need to be more than knee deep in order to, to be casting out to the channels, right? Um, but so it's looking for areas that, in, in my, so that you have access is probably the first and foremost, right? Right. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be looking for the most remote place in the world. It's going to take you a half hour to walk through the mangroves to sneak into a spot, right? I mean, those are good. And, and you know, as you get, start doing more and more of it, you're going to start looking for those kinds of spots. Um, but this, people tend to think or drive by a causeway or a beach where they see a lot of people think, oh, there's too many people or I'm never going to catch anything. First of all, most people don't know what they're doing and so they're not catching fish. So they're leaving them for you. Right. Um, so that's a good reason to, to, to learn and to, to get involved with Salt Strong so you know what you're doing. But, um, but you know, there, people are always amazed and surprised at not only the, the number of fish that are available, but even, even with other people all around, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting what, what you can get. But um, as I said, but causeways are a great way. So, um, you know, I look for beaches. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, here in Florida in particular, and I don't care if you're East Coast or West Coast, um, you don't necessarily need to be, you know, have a surf casting outfit, right? You, you, you can use the same stuff um, and you don't need to be casting out that far. As I said, you know, the biggest snook I catch every year are all probably within 30 to 40. 30 to 40 feet of the shoreline. Uh, and they tend to be in some of the troughs and stuff that we have that run right along the beaches, right? Um, but 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 there is some structure, just like that causeway has all that rubble, which is a form of structure. You have, you know, you may have some grassy areas, you have that deep, uh, the deep channel. Um, those are all different forms of structure that those fish love to, to hang out in or near. Um, same thing with the beach. So look for beaches that have rocks, look for beaches that have you know, kind of an irregular shoreline if you can. Uh, look for, for runouts if you see you've got a big trough all along the beach, right? And look for the area where that trough, where that water runs out when the tide is going out or comes in when the tide's coming in. That's all the kind of structure that you're looking for. And essentially, just look for something that's different than everything else that's around there. Right. Um, and that's, you know, that's the best way I could describe, describe structure. So, um, so get, get, go on, go on, uh, salt strong, you know, pull up your, your satellite images and just start looking, you know, pull, go in close and start looking for those kind of areas. Is there a road nearby that you can park and then get out and walk through? And maybe there's a cut in the mangroves that, that get you out to a flat. Um, or as I said, you know, the other thing, look, look, look for parks. I mean, look for the easy way. There's so many parks, waterfront parks down here mm -hmm. have some great access to some beautiful flats. Uh, that, you know, that don't require a lot of effort. Uh, there's also other people around, so it's a little bit safer. Uh, you know, as I tell people too, a lot of guys, well, I'm looking for the most remote place I, I can find. I said, that's great, but make sure you either have your phone or have somebody with you, especially if you don't want to get yourself in trouble. But, but again, for beginners especially, parks, go to boat ramps. 
Right. Um, almost always adjacent to boat ramps, there's an area that you can get in and wait along uh, wait along the shoreline. Um, so again, parks, boat ramps, uh, beaches, um, causeways, but those are kind of the most you know bridges. Uh, look for bridges almost you know be, at the beginning or end of almost every bridge. There's an area where there's shallower water, kind of at, at the base, right, where we can get out and wade one side or the other, or both sides. Um, that may lead even out to the to the channel that the bridge is going over, right? Uh, but but those are other areas, and is that, those those are the easiest to find when you're you know looking at satellite images, um, or if you think about where you drive to and from work every day. If you're in Florida and you live on the coast, there's a good chance you're driving over a causeway at some point, um, or you're passing a park, right? Um, or you're you know you're driving along uh, along the beach, whatever it is. But those are all all very, uh, very easy spots. And then as you start getting into it a little bit more, you'll start looking for those more remote spots, right? That, that aren't, there aren't as many people that might have more or better structure uh, where the fish aren't gonna be, you know, have as much pressure. Uh, and so you start, you know, looking for those kinds of things. And, and to me, it, it you know, the, I, there's nothing I love more in the world than going to a brand new spot and trying to figure it out. Um, yeah. without, in fact, you know, mm -hmm. I, I love using the maps, but I, I'm like, I want to do this all on my own. I, so if I see a spot, I want to go out and kind of figure it out. Um, you know, and I don't, I don't want to take a guide again, you know, because the fun to me is figuring it out. Um, right. but as you start doing it more and more, you start to, you start to put it all together. It's like anything else. Um, it's great to have all the resources that you have, like at Assault Strong and, and provide you with all this basic information, but it still doesn't, uh, replace getting out and doing it uh and and kind of figuring that piece out but um so again it's not that hard to find spots and again you'll you'll naturally progress into probably more remote and maybe more difficult spots to access as you start doing it more and more but it doesn't always lead to more or bigger fish either so some of those most obvious spots that are crowded can be can be fantastic um right. so you know, sounds sounds like i should have called you last week <laughs> well you know you were probably only about 45 minutes north of where I live. So uh, I actually yeah. live in a town called Tarpon Springs, which is okay. the very north end of Pinellas County. And so you you might have been up, uh, I don't know, were you in Pine Island or Ozello or- We were uh, uh, in uh, Spring Hill. Spring Hill, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were close to all that. You weren't far from me at all. You missed out. Next time, <laughs> give me a call. We'll we'll, uh, we'll get you out and, and do some real fishing. I will I certainly tried to do that. It. I tried to send them your way, but uh, by that time it was it was probably too late after all yeah. the money he had already spent. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> now I I want to say though it's uh, it's really interesting and something that I want to I, I want to point out to everybody. The the one word that you mentioned probably more than any other in that was structure, and a lot of people, from what I hear, when people ask me questions or they send me texts or 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 chats or anything like that. They say that they can't find the structure when they're fishing from land. They don't know how to do it. It's not the same when you're on a boat or you're on a kayak. It's, it's much different when you're on land or you're wade fishing, but that's not true. It, it's, it's a different type of a thing. Yes. You can't just float over it and let an electronics tell you where there's a, a drop, but your point was, I, I think it was, it was awesome. And I, I do this in a lot of my videos. I'll point out, I'll talk about current seams and eddies and quite often I'll say, you know what? The water looks different there and I don't know why. And I'll go over and I'll investigate it. And that's really what you're doing when you're out there on those flats and you're walking. Now, not only are you looking for the current seams or looking for eddies or looking for a little riffle that you didn't expect to see, but you also have your polarized glasses on, which we should talk about in a minute. Um, but is that, is that what you're really doing? You're looking for just changes to the surface of the water and you're using that to kind of zero in on where that structure actually is on those flats. Sure. The surface of the water can, can tell some of it. Um, especially if you're near bridges or inlets or, or you're in a pinch point between, you know, a couple islands where that tide is ripping through. Right. You can, like you said, you can see there's seams and, and current edges. Those are all, those are all great forms of structure, right? Uh, and, and they just funnel the bait fish into where the fish are. They tend to stand on, you know, either inside or the outside of those, those seams. So that's certainly one. But when you're weight fishing, it's less that probably than it is uh, in this example. You know, I'll, I'll use the causeway only because it's just such an easy way to do it. But 
so the, the very typical as i said so you got your your shoreline almost always there's some a uh, riprap you know rocks right along the immediate shore to try to keep from the shoreline from eroding right so you kind of got that um and on high tide that water comes right up on over that over those rocks and so that can be something that attracts the fish and they'll move right up against that shoreline when that happens but then you typically have kind of a sandy strip right uh that that kind of goes next and then that more often than is followed by an area that as you get a little bit deeper that might have some grass and then maybe you run into the channel right so as i tell people every one of those edges so where the rocks meet the sand that's an edge right so that's a form of structure where that sand meets the grass that's another edge that's another area where those fish might be where where the shallow water runs into the deeper water where the grass ends and you go into the channels that's another one uh, as I tell people, what, look how many times, especially in the winter, when the fish are a little bit deeper, you're throwing out into that deep water, you're reeling your, your jig in slowly. How often those fish hit just as before it gets to the shallow area, because those fish see, uh oh, that thing's going to get away from me now. Yeah. I'm going to grab it, right? But it's those edges, and again, edges, seams, whatever you want to call them, but, but those are big. So and if I happen to be fishing a flat, right? What I'm looking for, I don't like areas that are solid grass. Uh, when I first came down here, I used to grass flats, grass flats. You're going to find the fish on the grass flats. So I used to go find these areas, just acres and acres of solid grass. And I wouldn't catch a darn thing. <laughs> uh, and I couldn't figure it out. Well, what I've discovered over the years is solid grass, solid sand don't usually work. It, it's, it's, it's a flat that has a mixture of sand and in, in, in grass, kind of what I call a kind of a mottled or muddled bottom, right? That it's got a little bit of both. Um, and and or if I am fishing a grass flat, I want to be on a grass flat that has a number of potholes in it, right? So sandy areas. Uh, those are the those are you know you may have a huge grass flat, you might have one pothole. Those fish are going to be all near the pothole, right? So right. or if you're in a in an area that's predominantly sandy bottom or mud bottom, look for the areas where there's little patches of grass. Uh, it's almost the same thing. Those fish will be on top of that grass. So, uh, again, just anything that's a little bit different than the surrounding area. So what's what's happening? Just like I said, if you're in an area with all pretty much it's all calm, and you notice an area where there's like you said, like the if the tide's coming or going, and you see that the current kind of accelerates, it might be because it's either a deeper or shallow area uh, that's focusing that 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 tide. Um, listen, even I mean maybe this sounds even unbelievable to some extent, but if you find an area that looks just completely uniform from a depth perspective, almost every flat, it, there may be just a very subtle pothole that maybe it's three inches, five inches deeper than the rest of the area, but it's just enough to, to get those fish to want to sit in or get, sit near it, right? Um, so sometimes it's not as obvious as you might expect, but th there's always, you know, there's almost always something there that's different than the surrounding area. Uh, but that's, that's, so that's what I look for. I look for it just to provide a variety of, of different types of bottom, lots of edges, uh, proximity, you know, shallow water with proximity to deep water so I can fish deep water without having to obviously, you know, go, you know, typically, you know, you, there's no need to get any more than waist deep. Um, right. You know, to, to go from your waist to here, it, what are you picking? Maybe you're picking up an extra 10 feet of casting distance. I don't know, but it's generally not worth it. <laughs> So I just say, listen, there's really no no need to get much more than, than waist deep. So go with a little lighter line, a little heavier jig, and you can make up that 10 feet on your cast, right? Um, yeah. So so that's it. But the, the, I mean, those are the things that, that you want to look for. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a causeway, a beach, or a, or, a, or a grass flat, right? Th those are the things that you're you're looking for. So let's let's talk. So you were talking about, you know, you don't want to go too deep, so you're staying waist deep or or less if possible. So there was a question in there, uh, and I think maybe Tad had asked it about safety because yep. that is something that it does concern me when people ask, "Where should I go tonight?" And <laughs> when I'm out there on the water, it's like uh, I don't like telling people to go anywhere at night mm -hmm. um, because I don't know what kind of safety precautions they're they're taking. So, what do you recommend as far as safety when people are heading yeah. out to to wait? So let's let's start with night. Um, I, you know, I was a young idiot and I used to fish at night all the time and wade fish. Um, and again, it, it partly because I didn't know what, what, <laughs> what was really out there, you know? And yeah. so, uh, over the years I've discovered it, but you know, you're getting hit in the back of the head with a mullet a couple of times while it's pitch black and you're already nervous wreck. That's, that's usually all my heart can take. So I, I, I kind of stopped doing that. 
Um, so I don't, I don't, I, I rarely, if ever, wait at night. Uh, certainly dawn and dusk. I, and I said, you know, in the summertime, I will get out while it's still dark. You know, I might get out at four thirty or five in the morning, uh, but I'm fishing the beach usually or or very shallow areas, um, and and so I don't, I'm not that you know worried about stuff. But um, but yeah, I, I typically try to avoid night. Uh, the other thing, as I mentioned too, is listen. The most important piece of equipment you can have is a good pair of booties. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, and I don't wear, you know, most, you know, like fly fishermen like to wear up North, you know, you know, hard, hard, uh, high top booties that lace up. Um, I, I use more what you might even call a dive booty. Uh, so a neoprene booty, but the difference is it has a good, uh, thick, uh, rubber sole, right. uh, to protect you from the oysters or the rocks or, or glass or whatever it might be on the bottom or, you know, even the occasional stingray or, or whatever it might be. Uh, but, uh, but the booties are, if, if you, if you get nothing else and you're going to go wave fishing, do that. Uh, you know, people, oh, let me put my tennis shoes on and, and that, listen, that's okay, but you're going to get sand in your tennis shoes. You're going to get rocks and shell in your tennis shoes and you're going to be uncomfortable within about five minutes. Uh, so get a good, you know, kind of uh, booties that go up, you know, just below the calf, uh, that are fit tight, that are zippered, have a little neoprene ash. So you don't get all the sand and, and stuff in there either. But, uh, but a good pair of booties is, is great. Second, as I mentioned before, sunglasses and not, you know, great to protect your eyes, but so you can see, um, where you're walking. Right. And so that's what I tell people, just because you're wade fishing, you know, and in, in, in the water, you don't, you know, look where you're going. And so, you know, if you if you see a hole in front of you, don't step in it. If you see a you know a, a bed of oysters, don't step on them. Go around them. But you know, I I I see so often people are just they're just so enamored looking around fish they forget, you know, they're just walking and they don't they don't see it right. Um, so just look where you're going. The other thing is go slow. Um, it's it, you know it's I, I go very slow. I don't lift my feet up right because again we mentioned. Stingrays right. are probably the thing that, you know, more people that I talk to that are fearful of wade fishing, it's usually first stingrays and then second it's sharks, right? Um, and I know that, you know, I, every time I say this, I know the next day I'm going to go out and step on a stingray, but I've been uh, wade fishing, as I said, for 40 years. Uh, I've never stepped on or been stung by a stingray uh, while I'm fishing. I've been stung one time. That's with my, I was my wife and kids, and I was barefoot, and we were running around on the beach, and I I got stuck. Right, um, but it, it, you know, so have your booties. Make sure that you're you know taking small steps. And again, it, and it's almost again, it's not necessarily a shuffle your dread, but you're keeping your feet very low to the ground, right? Because the whole idea is that if you're doing that, you're going to kind of spook up anything that's in front of you. Uh, and 99% of the time, if there's rays out there. They, they feel you coming or hear you coming and then and they take off. Yeah. Um, and if you're doing your job and looking where you're going, you're going to see them most of the time. And, and all you do, just give them a little poke with the rod. They take off. Um, and I mean, I'm talking, you know, we get some huge, you know, these huge Southern stingrays out there that are, that are crazy looking, but um, they're, they're not, they're not aggressive. Uh, and if you get stung, it's almost always because you stepped on them and you weren't paying attention and you, likely didn't have booties on right um, I'll, I'll tell you what that with those booties i have fished pamlico sound many many times and i love doing that and that's one place where i take the kayak and then i do pull the drive up and i tether it to myself and just kind of walk the flats because it's that shallow it's that skinny and if you've ever fished pamlico sound you know it is all crabs it is all rays. I mean, it's fish all over the place. It is a very bustling uh, ecosystem there. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, the rays, they do shove off real quick. But I have found that the crabs get extremely aggressive and they'll actually come at you. Yeah. <laughs> so no, and, and it's good right. to have I, those booties. On. Yeah, no, and, and, you know, it's funny you say that because I, I, I fish, as I mentioned, in Cape Cod in the summertime a lot. And the crabs there are so much more aggressive than they yeah. are down here in Florida. And, uh, and down here, I don't usually worry too much about the crabs. Occasionally, you'll see a big old blue crab coming out at you, snapping, trying yeah. to scare you off, but not, but not too often. But so, as I said, but just take your time, go slow. And, and quite honestly, by going slow, you're going to actually improve your fishing anyway by thoroughly working an area and all the rest. Um, 
and, and I will say one thing. I don't, because I hear a lot of people, well, why am I worried about it? I'm just going to stand in one place, right, and fish. And I'm like, no, I don't stand in one place ever. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm, I am constantly moving when I'm wave fishing, right? I'll, I'll move until I get a hit or a fish. Then I'll take a few casts, you know, until I think that, you know, there's nothing left there or that I've, you know, I, hey, I found a fish. I'm fine. Let's move on. Um, but, you know, I, I move constantly. So, so you should be moving. And uh, that's why it, it's important that you, that you, you know, that you're protecting yourself. And then sharks, uh, probably more times when I'm out, I see sharks than I don't. Um, now, you know, we, we get, um, you know, there's a wide variety of sharks here. The ones that everybody's always worried about for the most part are the bull sharks because they're the most aggressive by far. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, and, and I've certainly had my encounters with them. And more often than not, it's been when I've been like, if I'm working a shoreline, maybe along the mangroves, um, and I'll see, I'll see a weight coming from the other direction, right? Well, you know what that shark's doing? He's doing the same thing I am. He's swimming along that edge looking for, looking for fish. Um, and so I'll just stop. Let them come, and if I if they continue to get close, because they probably haven't even seen me, I might just poke them in the nose, and then they they'll take off. But right. that's almost always they take off before you before you even you know you even get close. Um, so uh, and listen, you know we get lots of black tips down here. Listen, they're great. You talk about a fun fish to catch while you're wade fishing on light gear. Uh, I mean, they hit, they run, they jump. Uh, I mean, they're they're a riot. Uh, so they're actually a good target for you. But, well, I, and I will say this, I have a good friend that's a, an ER doctor, and he was talking about the how many shark bites that he treats. And I said, well, you don't hear about that. many." he goes, well, they're not getting bit when they're swimming. He says it's almost always fishermen uh, who have caught a shark and uh, decide that they can just put their hand right behind the head, or even worse, they grab it by the tail and don't realize that thing can come right around and, and bite you, right? Yeah. Um, so as I tell people, I... If you're going to be out fishing for sharks and you're wade fishing, I don't even bother. I try to get them as close as I can, and I'll, I'll, I'll just cut the line. Um, you know, that jig head will, will be gone in, in, in a matter of a week or so from their mouth, uh, right. typically. So it's not worth uh, trying to unhook them to save a, you know, a 50-cent jig head. Um, yeah, there's there's uh, I so I'm one of the, I was pointing to myself because I have been bitten by a shark, and it's because I was a fisherman, and uh, I wasn't paying attention and uh it, it hurts <laughs> it actually yeah, doesn't hurt as sure. much as you'd think it just slices so cleanly because her teeth are so sharp but i i do i i love your point about you know just cut it off before you get it in there and there are mm -hmm. sharks that i would recommend doing that with in a kayak as well which is what i fish from certainly in a boat i mean you get a large shark you're not trying to bring that anywhere in. you're getting it close you're cutting it off and i think a lot of i've seen a lot of people wade fishing or when they catch a shark running out to pick it up when it's in the water and yeah. carry it onto the sand which is the <laughs> I, yeah. I get your heart's in the right place but your mind is not it those mm -hmm. things can bend all the way around if you're touching their tail you're in range and uh and if you're in a kayak please don't pull one up into your lap because it can turn <laughs> and it can get you and when it turns yeah. and gets you up there if it's in your lap it's turning and it's getting you right in the chest so th just yeah, there's important parts there. There are a lot of important parts for everybody. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I think it is funny, though. Yeah, it's mostly fishermen. I was one of them. I didn't go to the hospital for it, but I was on the boat with my grandfather, who was a doctor, and he gave me the most disdainful look. <laughs> like, I can't believe you just did that. I was like, yeah. oh, you well, saw it. As you said, it's, it's really very common. And so that's, that's yeah. why I said, there's no point in even, even messing with it. You know, the other, which surprised me, we, we do get certain times of the year where we get a lot of jellyfish. Yeah. Uh, and maybe even more so on the beach where we might get the Portuguese man of war, things like that. And, and when they're in the water, I just tell people, don't, don't go in. You can't even see all the tentacles. You think you can stay away from it and all the rest. Um, and, and it is painful. That's something you want to avoid. Uh, if you're going to be fishing inshore on the flats and occasionally you'll see some coming in smaller stuff. Then I tell people, listen, that's a good time. If you're really going to have to go put the waders on, um, that'll, that'll protect you from, from the uh, jellyfish uh, things, but, uh, you know, so that, that's the only thing I say, but, but those are really the three things you most worry about other than, uh, maybe the, the, the number one safety thing that I am, if I find is people hooking themselves with the lures, um, and yeah. almost always it's somebody using top water with multiple treble hooks. 
Uh, and so, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I went to single hooks long before it was fashionable only because I got tired of trying to pull them out of people's, you know, ears or, or hands or whatever it might be. Uh, and so much less likely to happen with, with those single hooks. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, quite honestly, also, if you happen to hook them, I think you had a better chance of landing them with the single hook than you do the trebles. Uh, Absolutely. The actual hook rate might be a little less, but once you got them hooked, I think you're going to get, have a little better chance of getting them in. But, but those are really the, the biggest issues. And, and if you take the right precaution, they're really not, again, a huge, a huge issue. Um, but, you know, you also got to be respectful if you happen to see a big shark or whatever. You know, don't push your luck. It's if you can walk out, just walk out. Let them go by. Uh, no point in tempting them, right? Uh, so, you know, that that's what I think people would be shocked if they knew how many sharks were, you know, actually swimming out there. And, uh, and, and how frequently, right. So, uh, yeah, you, you see them, uh, you know, down to, if you just go to the beach in the summer and I'm talking New Jersey, right. So sitting there in New Jersey with my two kids in the water, along with my nieces and nephews, and we're sitting there and we're just kind of watching and the waves are coming up and all the kids are jumping through them and 30 or 40 sharks are going through the, you know, as it thins out and you can yeah. see the sun, you can just see all these, these sharks swimming through there and people didn't realize it. You know, they just don't know. They're always there. They're always out yeah. there and not one person got bit. Nobody was going to get bitten. Um, you know, the, the, the sharks weren't aggressive. They were just doing what they do. And yeah. uh, it's, I don't know. People act like the sharks are, it's amazing when there's a shark around. Well, yeah, well, it's always, there. you know, one other thing too, I will say is that if you, you know, if you're out fishing a plant and there's huge bait pods around, well, they're attracting the fishermen because yeah. that's where the fish are, but they're also attracting the sharks very often. Yeah. Um, so I always tell people, listen, be really cautious. It's, it's generally not a great idea to wade in the middle of a, uh, of a huge, you know, pot of bait. So right. I kind of stay to the outside um, same thing, even if, you know, with the water, the, the dirtier or cloudier water tends to be more problematic because the sharks can't really tell who you, they, they don't know. So clear water tends to be less, uh, less an issue, but if you're, you know, if you're in cloudy or darker water, uh, stained water, and, and there's a ton of bait around, I'd say, you know, be careful. Just use a little common sense is really what it comes down to. Yeah. Now what, what color, uh, yeah, we got to get the questions after this. Let me just ask yeah. this, this one other one. When you're out there wade fishing specifically, what color polarized glasses are you typically recommending people bring if they have multiple colors to choose from? Yeah, um, you know, <laughs> it's funny. I, I actually uh, I just ordered a new pair of sunglasses the other day, but I've been using. You know, again, I fish. First of all, I got to you know, are you fishing typically in 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 uh, low light situations, right? Are you fishing more midday and all the rest, right? So. If you're fishing in low light situations, then you're probably going to want to, uh, you know, some lenses that are going to be copper, amber, things like that. They actually enhance, right? Right. Uh, they don't cut out as much as the light. Um, you still have enough uh, uh, contrast that you can see the fish along the bottom, all that kind of stuff. Um, but as you start, you know, if you're fishing more midday, a um, little deeper water, then you may start going to some of the grays and greens. Uh, you might get into some of the mirrored lenses, things like that. Um, but, you know, kind of a good all around. I, I like a good kind of green, gray, green lens is kind of a good all around. Um, and because I, you know, I typically start early in the morning and I'm fishing through midday, I'm kind of encountering all those different things. But uh, so that's what I tell people, you know, unless, you know, you can afford to you know, to buy multiple pairs of sunglasses and change them out based upon where you're fishing or the time of day. Great. But, you know, I, I wear uh, prescription sunglasses that cost me 500 bucks a pop. Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not typically going to have five or six different pairs of sunglasses. So, right. um, you know, so that's, so that's, you know, typically what I'm doing kind of the gray, gray, green, um, you know, maybe a little bit of a copper or rose tint. Sometimes I like those. Uh, but, uh, I don't typically get fishing shallow flats to go for the mirrored, uh, the mirrored sunglasses. Um, you know, I think that's almost more of a fashion statement than anything else. And yeah. that's one thing, weight fishermen or not, we're not fashion statements as, as you can tell from the shirt I got on here today. So, yeah. I'm wearing my, my car heart. So maybe, well, Ed likes to look fancy. Yeah. Dave, you should see his fish 
what is it? The fish or no, the cat taco shirt. Oh, the taco cat shirt. Uh, Soulstrom hasn't awesome. seen that yet. I need uh, to break that one out. Yeah, we'll we'll get that on in a couple of weeks. All right. Well, thank you, Dan. So I feel good because I do wear the I do wear glasses with the gray and the green. I found that that yeah. works really well inshore. So and I, I have just... the blue for offshore. Yeah, that's what I was always told. Gray, green for back bay, inshore stuff, and then blue for offshore. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. All right, Ed, want to bring up some questions? Let's yeah, roll we through got a, because we're running out of time. A couple of good ones here. Uh, Mike D from Palm Harbor uh, says he's he's fished with you several times and you are unreal. Uh, he <laughs> went with you one time, 30 minutes. You had five snook and he never had a bite. So here's a good <laughs> shout out. So, so that's Mike D. That's Mike Drozdowski. So uh, Mike, how you doing? <laughs> I'm glad you're watching. But uh, so the only reason that Mike didn't catch any fish is he wasn't a paid client. If he had paid me, I'd have had him on those fish, right? So he, he actually introduced me to some guys at a fishing club down here, and, and we fish the same area a lot. So I do run into him all the time. He, he's a great guy, a great fisherman. And uh, I know now he's probably catching as many or more fish than I do. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, so he, he's a good guy. And uh, as I said, if you you know, if we're on a paid, uh, on a paid charter, Mike, I, I would have let you take a shot at all those snook. And, and I had you <laughs> cast into the wrong side of the of the jetty uh, on purpose just to make you think you needed to hire me. So, I love that. Okay. Ed would do that to me, too. <laughs> <laughs> you would, Ed. I do it to you, too. <laughs> yeah, you do, it, you do it to me. So, yeah. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll throw this one here, Joe, uh, for the told me to break out this shirt for the pre-flounder show so i will do that uh well it's going to be a post opening of flounder show this year we've got uh guests lined up ahead of that so it's wow. going to be after the first week yeah nice. that's how busy we are it's crazy i don't know you just tell me the day beforehand so yeah will do <laughs> uh here's another one sorry if you guys can hear these airplanes the airport's going crazy tonight yeah. um Here's another one from Travis Carney. Uh, do you carry a stepladder on your flat trips when using your kayak as a shuttle? No, I, again, I'm kind of a, a minimalist. So uh, quite honestly, if it's just me, usually I don't even bring the kayak. I, I, I typically will bring the kayak or a paddle board if I have a client, um, again, which allows, I just take my, you know, the same milk crate I put in the back of my kayak, I put in the paddle board, whatever it is. I got four rod holders. I put a little cooler in there a first aid kit, whatever, you know, um, and then just, just have tie it off and do that. But no, I, I don't, I don't carry a step ladder. Although I do know I've got a couple of guys I fish with that uh, carry step ladders and actually not even a step ladder, a full, you know, eight foot ladder in their, in their vehicles uh, because there's some areas they'd like to fish that are uh, there where there's seawalls and they need that to get down the seawall and to get to some of these flats. So, so those are the crazy guys, but I've, I've never been a step ladder guy. That's awesome. I have seen them being used on the flats, and uh, that was a, actually a really good question. Now, I, I've actually seen it used up here over mud flats because you can't walk on the mud without sinking. And guys were dropping the ladder, and they were oh, walking yeah. out, and then they were getting off the ladder, sinking, but they were putting the ladder down again. They're stepping back up on it, and so they were using it almost like snowshoes. It was oh. it was insanity, but it it worked. I mean, they got really far out on the flat, and they were able to fish it. Yeah, there's actually a product out there. I, I'm trying to remember what it's called, but like called duck feed or something like that. But it, it's actually a shoe that's made, and it's a little bit like a like a uh, a snowshoe, right? It's got a big wide base to it, but it's made specifically to be walking on those kinds of muddy bottoms. Um, and I, you know, I've never tried them. I've seen a number of, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's on Instagram or whatever, but people trying them and using them, and it looks like they they actually work, but. I, I just assume avoid those kinds of areas again. I mean, we're lucky enough that we have enough areas with firm bottom around here that, that I don't have to deal with. And, and I also the people, especially if you're fishing by yourself, avoid those areas because you can get in trouble really quick. Um, yeah. If you get into you get into a soft area and it's almost impossible to get out unless you have someone to help you or you happen to have a tree or a mangrove or something else nearby or a kayak that you can use to get yourself out there. Yeah, I've yeah. been there. Oh. I will say I noticed being, you know, the week I spent down there, you guys have a lot more sand uh, than we do up here. It's, it's very more rocky and sandy than, than the mud that we get. Yep. 
Um, all right. Uh, oh, here's one. Boss man Joe. He is uh, oh. partaking tonight. So <laughs> good to see you hanging out, Joe. Hey, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that's really about it for questions, unless anybody else has anything they want to put in the chat real fast. Yeah, I think this is this is really interesting to me, and it's something that I have to do more of. I, I mean, I'm being totally honest. I, I, unlike Dave, who has the boat and the kayak and the paddle boards and prefers to wade, I have I don't have a boat now, but I've had a boat and a kayak at the same time and wade fished, and I I preferred the kayak. Um, now I only have the kayak and on the paddle boards or anything. And part of it was, honestly, Dave, as I mentioned, I don't consider myself to be great at wade fishing. And part of it is because I know a lot of guys like you, guys that will go out and at the end of the week, they could literally send you 100 pictures of keeper size fish that they caught when they're wading. And I never got to that point. I just haven't found those places on the water. And I guess I'm just not, I guess I just haven't invested the time to do it because I know what they look like. Right. It's exactly yeah. as you said. I know but, how to find them. I just haven't done it. Do we uh, have the access though up here? Because I mean, there's, wow. there's a lot of mud everywhere. <laughs> so, some places don't, you know, I mean, good luck to all the guys in Maryland and Virginia that are on the Chesapeake in certain areas where you'll get arrested if you try to get near the coastline. Um, let alone, there are some beautiful flats, but you, you yeah. can't get to them in a lot of places. Right. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, maybe that's part of it too. It's a lot of actual bank fishing here, but yeah, it's a little bit here. So, I mean, where we are, kind of from Tampa south to Naples, there's just a ton of areas to wade fish. You know, not only the beaches, but you got all the barrier islands inside of the barrier islands, all the different bays, you know, Tampa Bay, Charlotte Harbor, Sarasota Bay. There's all kinds of access there. And then, and then on the East Coast, from really from Lauderdale all the way up to, to Jacksonville, there's there's lots of areas to fish um, and to wade fish. But uh, but you're right. I mean, I, I have fished you know a lot of areas where it's really very you know getting to the Carolinas, it's very difficult um, to do uh, to do a lot of wade fishing there. Texas is a is a wade fisherman's paradise. Yes. Um, you know Louisiana, not a great place to wade necessarily. It's great fishing if you got a boat or other ways to get out there, but not a lot of not a lot of great uh, areas to access to wade fish. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we, we really are spoiled here. So, you know, if, if you're going to be a, a diehard wade fisherman, then uh, I suggest that you, uh, you pick up and move to Florida. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's one more question, Ed, that we have to throw in there and it ha we have to do it because as Joe called you waiter, Dave, what's your recommendation for waiters? If now you, you do fish up in the Northeast, so you know how it can be in Cape Cod and, and the areas north where sometimes you just have to wear waders. So what, what yeah. brands, if any, do you recommend? Uh, you know, I, so, so I kind of evolved on the waiter side of things as well. So first of all, most of the time here, you know, you really don't need waders most of the year, right? So for me, kind of the cutoff is once the, uh, uh, once the water temperature drops below 70, uh, then I'm probably putting the waders on. Um, now I know you're laughing because that might be as warm as it gets where you are. I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, no, it so gets into below 70, yeah, I'm putting on, I'm putting on the waders. Uh, and listen, it used to be when I was younger, I, I, I didn't even, I, I don't ever even put a pair of waders on until probably 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I just would make, if my upper body was warm enough, I was fine going in the water. But as I got older, I'd come in and I'd be shivering the rest of the day, my knees and my ankles and my feet were killing me. I'm like, okay, I better get some waders. But, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, here, when we get some of these, we do get, you know, some really cold, good cold fronts coming through. You can buy a pair of, of, you know, three to five millimeter neoprene waders that, um, you know, from Caddis. I mean, there's a number of different that 70 bucks stuff yeah. here. I will say, I don't really care whether you get neoprene or you get breathable and whatever, but make sure they're stocking foot waders here. Um, because we do, even though I told, we talk about sand and all that stuff, we do get a, a lot of soft areas and you may be going from a firm area to a soft area. You've got those big old lug, you know, hard rubber boots on. First of all, they're never comfortable. They never fit right. And the other thing I do, it's, it's not uncommon for me to cover 
a couple a couple miles or more of you know uh, either getting to where I'm going to fish or just shoreline and I'm fishing. And you try hiking two miles there and two miles back in those, you're, you're going to have blisters. You're going to be miserable. Yeah. Um, so stocking foot waders, and then I actually use the exact same booties that I wear when I'm wet wading. Uh, I just get a pair that's I get a, a they're two sizes bigger, and I just put them right over my stocking feet, zip them right up over that. But um, so for you know waders, you can get those neoprene waders for 75, 80 bucks. Um, you might get a couple seasons out of them, maybe a little more. It depends on how brutal you are on them. Uh, but typically, you know, they're easy. They're easy to repair. And the other thing I like about them is that when it's cold here, I don't have to put any, on anything underneath. I, I should that didn't sound right. I don't have to put a lot of, you know, long uh, sweatpants or anything like that. Just I can just right. wear my shorts or whatever I want under that, and that's I'll be plenty warm. Um, but it, it, and so the colder the better for those. But as it starts to warm up a little bit, um, then I like to go to the uh, you know to the to the breathable waders. And you know I've I've had you know I've had my six seven hundred dollar sims waders uh and i they were great they lasted me a long time but i also discovered over over time that I, and actually because i would buy waders for my clients right to have you know excess pairs so i kind of found a middle of the road pair that it's about 100 for 150 to 200 bucks you can buy a, a decent pair of uh breathable waders stocking foot waders uh there's a brand that i like called compass 360 uh you can, i think i think you can go to their website uh and you know they have a, a variety of different you know ranges but if you buy a buy a pair of those between 150 200 bucks they're, they're gonna last you I, I get three or four seasons out of them and i'm wearing them every day right for yeah. for months at a time um and and they're really good but the other thing too is you know i, I would mention that a lot of people don't we, ideally I, I love the uh breathable waders but with the zip that goes down the middle so you can do what you got to do without right. having to take everything off right um and when you get to be my age doing what you got to do happens more frequently than it did when <laughs> i was your age so uh it definitely makes it easier to 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 to, to manage things that way but and i and i you know compass 360 has a pair of, of these as well and uh you can also just kind of pull them down when it gets too warm uh which makes it easy so they're they're and they're they're really little bit more flexible that way so I, I really like something along that line but um, but there's, listen there's a lot of a lot of brands I, I just typically tell if you're if you're buying the the breathable um the cheapest brand the cheapest models usually aren't going to last that long um and they really aren't all that great so it's typically better to to you know you don't need the cadillac um but you probably want to buy the chevy at least Right. Um, yeah. And so something kind of more more mid middle of the road is going to be be good and be a good value for it. Yeah, I've had I've had the real cheap ones, and it's a little disappointing when they don't last a full season. Yeah. But it, it, I saw men. You mentioned Caddis. They make some decent ones. Um, they're they're towards the lower end. Um, Frog togs are towards the lower end, but they they've made some decent ones. Uh, but stocking foot, I agree. I've I've gotten my foot stuck in. Uh, with with the boots on it's easier to get out than the uh the boot foot for some yeah. reason those boot i mean because they don't they're not really fitting to your feet they're just kind of sitting yeah. in there so you end up pulling your leg out and then your waders are coming off as you're trying to get out of the mud so you definitely want to have actual footwear on your feet not a boot that's just going to pull yeah. off your waders because you will lose your you, waders yeah if you just a thin pair of either polypropylene or, or even um, neoprene socks um, under, you know, just under your, under your bare feet will make it a lot easier for you to get your feet in and out of those waders. Um, and especially if you've been sweating in them and trying to get them off, that's all, like you said, get, getting, getting them off is harder than putting them on. Yeah. Uh, but if you have the, a pair of just, again, and they don't have to be expensive, but just a pair of, of, of polypropylene or neo, neoprene socks and your feet will just slide in and out of those without any problem. That's awesome. All right. Well, we, we are, oh, we're over the hour. See, Dave, I told you, Dave, before this, we're, we're going to look up and see that we're over time if we're not careful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was, I wasn't doubting that we could fill an hour of uh, yeah. time talking about yeah, fishing. So it definitely goes fast. Yeah. And I have about a thousand other things that I would like to talk about with you sometime. So <laughs> we'll have to reconnect. 
No, oh, I love, man. I'd love to do it again. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure. In fact, uh, I'm sure we'll get some comments that we probably didn't uh, didn't really talk a lot about, you know, kind of the technical side of things here with, uh, you know, what lures and, and retrieves and all that kind of stuff. So maybe we can do that next time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm sure people let me know any questions or any any topics that you'd like, because the more that you get to me, the quicker I can go to Dave and say, hey, it's a bunch of people that want you back. So uh, send send some feedback or questions to me that you didn't have answered. I'll be happy to uh, to get something put together again. But I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Dave, thank you so much for coming on. You were one of the guys that, uh, you know, I, I watched your course when it first came out and I was, I used a lot of the information in there and, uh, and it was really the structure part that, that really stuck out to me. And I looked at that and said, you know what, that's, that was one of the things I was doing wrong. I wasn't finding the structure the way that I was supposed to. So, uh, if you're a salt strong insider, you probably have access to that. If you go into the courses area in the community, if you're not an insider member, well, you don't have access to it. So you should probably join so you can check it out and take the course. It's it's a great course. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody, thanks for coming in. We're going to announce the guest for next week coming up soon. But we are going to be talking, uh, it looks like Black Drum, as well as the New Jersey Artificial Reef System. So we're going to talk a little bit about the conservation side of fishing as well in that one. It's going to be a really good one, um, but I'm not quite prepared to put up the thumbnails and everything. So we'll get to that later in the week. Dave, thanks again for coming on. Ed, My pleasure. Rich, Ed, on. thank you very much. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thanks for coming. Everyone, get out there, get on the water, get some tight lines. Or get in the water. <laughs>